Senator Warren, it's wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me. I'm Our delighted pleasure. to be here. We're delighted to hear too. Well, on behalf of about 50, we may have just 75 texters at, at this point, um, I want to ask you what, what, what they're asking. You know, you were among the senators with, with Bernie Sanders and some others that uh, voted to stop providing offensive weapons to Israel for the war against Hamas until they lifted restrictions on humanitarian aid going into Gaza. But you also voted for the $14 billion mm -hmm. to go to Israel. So the texters want to know, uh, why you voted for the $14 billion, uh, if you're trying to get uh, this uh, humanitarian aid sent into Gaza? Well, let me, let me start with the piece of legislation that we voted for was not an up or down on aid to Israel alone. It was the funding for Ukraine. And Ukraine is on the front lines defending democracy. Uh, and they are literally, literally running out of bullets. They're running out of ammunition. They're running out of equipment. And I think it is crucial that we be in that support. I have argued for conditioning aid to Israel long before what happened on October 7th. Um, and it is basic US policy, not articulated until much of this came along, that we do condition aid. We give aid to those who are following international law and also following domestic law. Um, now what has happened is that because a group of us have pressed hard on President Biden and in this funding bill that, that we voted for, um, got the president to commit in writing to conditioning aid uh, to any nation. It does not call out Israel. It says this is the across the board policy of the United States that we condition aid both on of uh, adherence to international law in terms of how civilians are treated in a conflict, but also access to humanitarian aid. And that this has, I don't want to oversell, but it has some teeth in it by saying that every 90 days there has to be a report in writing that's initiated from the country receiving aid. And then our uh, Department of State has to certify the accuracy of what's in that report, that there is compliance. This is actually a big shift in U.S. policy, one that's kind of been overlooked in all the other discussions, that we are beginning, I think, as a nation to take more responsibility for what happens when our aid is used elsewhere. You know, beyond that, uh, I was going to say your boss, not your boss, your leader, Chuck Schumer, <laughs> I believe the highest ranking Jewish elected official actually on our history, gave a speech the other day saying that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was an obstacle of peace, there should be new elections. When the president was asked to comment on that, he said, quote, good speech, mm -hmm. I'll say no more. Do you share the sentiment of uh, Leader Schumer? I share it, and I said much of the same thing a couple of weeks earlier, and have had many conversations with my colleagues around this. One of the things that I thought was really terrific about the speech is he talked about, it is complex. There are passionate feelings on both sides, but that Prime Minister Netanyahu has prosecuted this war in a way to create an enormous humanitarian disaster. And that the continuing uh, blocking access to humanitarian aid has um, undercut Israel's position, not only in the Middle East, but throughout the world. Um, I see this as a moment when we should be talking about four things. Uh, ceasefire, um, uh, getting the hostages back, uh, a much, much more aggressive humanitarian aid that flows in. But fourth and most crucially, pushing both parties toward peace. Uh, and that's a two-state solution. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has made clear, he's a hard no on that. And that basically means he is very much inconsistent with U.S. policy, and we believe with what is ultimately peace and security in the region. You know, uh, uh, we mentioned to Charlie Senate before, a colleague here, that in a piece Nick Kristof wrote in the Times over the weekend, which I'm guessing you saw, I, I saw a shocking statistic that 68% of Israelis living in Israel oppose the provision of uh, medicine and food 
to the Palestinians in Gaza, which sadly to me, I mean, beyond the sadness of the position, even though we're in no way diminishing the horror, obviously, of October 7th, uh, it sort of buttresses Netanyahu's cruel blockade, does it not? You know, I, I'm going to do this the other way. I don't know the polling, and I don't know how it's done, certainly, in a, in a different country. But I'll put it the other way around about the responsibility of leadership. Leadership is, is putting your nation first, and what you believe is in the long-term interests of your nation. Israel lives in a very dangerous neighborhood. And for Israel to survive long term in that neighborhood, it has to find a way to get along with Palestinians. And my view on this, it has been the view of the United States for a long time, is that means two nations. Two peoples in two nations living in dignity and security, self-determination. And a leader should be pushing in that direction. Starving people to death is not pushing in that direction. We're talking to Senator Elizabeth Warren. She's with us for the next half hour, give or take a few minutes. You know, we were talking before you got here with listeners about uh, the former uh, president's calling uh, about a bloodbath. Oh. People were saying it was, you know, some people were arguing that he meant a bloodbath in the auto industry. Oh, wrong. But, but um, it doesn't sound like to me. He was talking about a bloodbath in the country. If he doesn't win, he was talking about uh, migrants coming to this country, calling them animals, these horrible words. And we often wonder why it is that he's neck and neck with Joe Biden in the polls. Do you have any theories? I mean, you've been elected to office here. Do you have any th thoughts about what the voters might be thinking? So look, I, I think that polling has a lot of problems. But for me, this just emphasizes why the election of 2024 is so critically important. You know, I, I know we say this every year uh, or every four years, you know, this is the most important election in our lifetimes, but I actually think it's been stepping up in terms of how true that is. This will be the first time that I can think of in modern history where we're going to have two people who've actually been president of the United States running against each other. One of them is Donald Trump. One of them is Joe Biden. Donald Trump was president for four years. He managed to do two things, uh, a tax cut, $2 trillion tax cut, mostly sucked up by millionaires, billionaires, and giant corporations, and an extremist Supreme Court that overruled Roe versus Wade. And now he talks of destroying democracy. He does. He talks about being an autocrat for a day. He talks about a bloodbath, not going to accept the outcome of an election. He showed us his cards on January 6th and seems to be doubling down on that. And the contrast with Joe Biden is, it just couldn't be stronger. Here's Joe Biden, he's president for three and a half years, and what does he get done? It's, it's on the ground things. It's $35 insulin, it's over-the-counter hearing aids, it's canceling student loan debt for four million people. Hearing aids was you. That is, correct, it is, yes. uh, it's, uh, but it's, it's things that touch people, junk fees, it's getting rid of all these junk fees and passing the first increase in corporate taxes in 30 years. It's a fairness in the system. It's not sexy, but wow, it makes a difference in our nation. Yeah, but the, the reality is uh, that, uh, and by the way, you're talking to two people who think that he is one of the more accomplished presidents of our lifetimes, at least. However, uh, and I don't, I think polls are pretty accurate this uh, day and age, Senator. When 70% of the American people, including a majority of Democrats, say these are not the candidates I want to lead this country. I know the choices are the choices, but it seems like democracy, small d, breaks down somewhere when that's who you get. Do you? You don't. Have, you're shaking. Well, you don't have a problem with it. It's it's not a question. This is this is what it is. These are our choices, and we could talk about all of the path dependence that got us here today. But I want to say this part about. It. I think Joe Biden is doing a really good job, and and not just an okay job. I mean a really good job. Name me a president ever, who had a majority that was as skinny as the majority mm -hmm. was in the first two years in office. And yet, look at all he was able to accomplish. Yeah, but name me a president who's gone. going to be 86 uh, at enough. the end of his second term. Fair enough. On the other hand, let's make a point about voters are entitled 
to ask whatever they want to ask about elected officials. They can say whatever they want. They can vote based on whatever they want. That's the nature of a democracy. I think the question about age mostly is a question about can he do this job? And here's what I know for sure. I don't have to predict. I can see that he does the job. Every time I talk with him, the man is on top of it. The man gets it. The man gets the issues. The man's ready to talk about it. He knows his facts and figures. He knows his policy. He knows what he's trying to get done. That's what I look for. In so a can president. I use your words? The sure. One more question on this. Uh, you say the man can do the job. If called upon, can Kamala Harris do the job? Yes, absolutely. Okay. We're talking to Senator Elizabeth Warren. You know, one of the other things I think people are kind of stunned about and frustrated about is the sense that the justice system is not doing what we hoped it would do in terms of the former president and the Supreme Court seems to be almost actively stalling uh, so that the two federal cases against him, the documents case at Mar-a-Lago and the um, insurrection January 6th may never, looks like they may not make it. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to people about that? I mean, I, we lot, put a lot of stock in in the justice system in the United States yeah. and it's, and um, that and the fact that he seems to be winning is, well, that's a different issue, just information, but the justice system, start with that. Well, I, I was talking about what did Donald Trump accomplish in four years? And one of the things he accomplished was that $2 trillion tax break that went mostly to people at the top. But the other thing he accomplished was an extremist Supreme Court and not just Supreme Court. It's up and down. The people who got confirmed, and, and look, I, I want to do both halves. I'm laying that right at Donald Trump's feet, but understand this. The Republicans have played the long game, and they've played it smart. They've been playing it for 30 years. The Federalist Society's been out there carefully cultivating what could almost be described as stealth candidates. Candidates who don't have a big written record, uh, who, but who have hardcore conservative. But I don't just mean small case, uh, small c conservative, but just really extreme views. Getting as many of those people into the pipeline, into the federal judicial system. And Marjorie, it shows up. The consequences of that show up. And it doesn't just show up when they overturn Roe versus Wade. It doesn't just show up when they gut the Voting Rights Act. It doesn't just show up when they try to destroy unions. It shows up over and over. And right now, it shows up in Trump's favor. Are we surprised? You know, uh, Senator Warren, we have uh, Nancy, former Judge Nancy Gardner on every week. Yeah. And a couple of months before that uh, ago, we had her on with uh, Larry Tribe, who I'm sure you know quite mm -hmm. well. They were on this presidential commission on the Supreme Court. They both went in supporting uh, um, uh, term limits. And during the commission, they concluded it requires a constitutional amendment, so forget that. And they switched their position. They may not like the word switch, but their position ended up being uh, we believe in expansion of the court, which obviously only needs uh, statutory change. Congress can do this. It's done it seven or nine times, whatever it is in our history. Where are you on that? I agree with them. Why isn't anything happening? Because we don't have a majority in the House and the Senate. Joe Biden doesn't support it either, and, does he? Well, we'll see. Uh, right now, the filibuster, as you know, blocks anything in the Senate that takes a major change mm -hmm. of law. So the first thing we got to do, if we really want our democracy to work, in my view, is we got to we got to get rid of the filibuster. But we take back the House and the Senate, uh, hold on to the majority in the Senate, and Joe mm -hmm. Biden in the White House. We get rid of the filibuster, we can start to make changes we need to make. So let's uh, move to some areas where I think your exultation will show consumer <laughs> issues. Can we start there? I'm ready. I had a feeling okay. it might be. Yeah. Okay, want to be the centerfold in consumer issues. You have reports. something okay. to do with uh, uh, a thing that is so long overdue, which is uh, free uh, simplified filing. Yes, 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 millions yes. Of people. yes. What exactly is it? Can we do it in Massachusetts? What's the deal? Yes, yes, yes. It's called direct file. And it means instead of going to TurboTax or some other outfit where the average American pays about $150, takes nine hours to fill out their taxes, instead you can just go to something called directfile.irs.gov. I wish you could see Senator Warren at this moment, by the way, but go ahead. <laughs> All right, that's direct, you interrupted me, so I'm going to say it again, <laughs> directfile.irs.gov. And if you have, a, I want to say, a fairly simple tax return because right now they're just piloting it. 
So if you have W-2 income, ordinary salaried mm -hmm. income, or unemployment or social security as your income, and you're not taking a bunch of fancy deductions, you can just do it right online. And here comes the best part. This is government working the way it should. It's trying to make it easier and cheaper for Americans to pay their taxes. Look, nobody wants to pay their taxes, but you gotta pay taxes, and in most places around the world, you can pay them directly. It's called direct file. So they're rolling this out as a pilot. You can do this in 12 states. Massachusetts is one of them. Uh, you can do this in 12 states. By the way, New Hampshire is another one. I don't know how far you reach out there. We do. Um, 12 states. And um, the IRS is asking for feedback because they want to get it better. But, but they've now had people who've actually logged on and done it. The first one, I... I call her patient zero. I was talking with the head of the IRS last week. You're going to love this. So Danny Werfel is telling me he's the head of the IRS. And he said, we talked to the first, literally the first person who finished filing her taxes. She's down in Texas. She described how she saved $400. That's what she paid last year. She said it took her less than an hour to finish. And she said it was so darn easy. So we got to do this. Directfile.irs.gov. That's what, it. Okay, when you so go on the page, by the way, the first okay. link you have is Are You Eligible? And I just looked at it. It's pretty simple. Yeah. It's so what is the status of it in Massachusetts right now? So in Massachusetts, you can use it. Now, you have to work through a little bit more because they have to integrate it with state taxes and so on. But they'll just answer your questions. And if you're not eligible, it will tell you. And we will hope that they get enough feedback and expand it for next year. Um, but anybody should get out there and try it. We think that a lot of people here in Massachusetts are eligible. Look, it's free, it's easy, nobody's required to do it, but it's an option that's available to you because it's about making government work for people. So a big brouhaha about the possible, um, not really banning of TikTok, but saying TikTok is going to not be owned by a Chinese company anymore. Where are you on the TikTok situation? So I want to do two parts on this one. The first part is we have a lot of rules about foreign ownership of media. And there's no reason that TikTok should be any different in that sense. There are restrictions on foreign companies, uh, certainly foreign governments, influencing the ownership of our media for a lot of good reasons. Having said that, I want to do the other half. we got a problem in social media, and the problem we've got is we just don't have enough curbs. We don't have enough that is about data privacy, enough that's about not targeting our children. Um, and that means we don't need one law for TikTok. We need a law that applies across the board to social media. Now, you're sitting down. Marjorie, you probably want to sit down before I finish this next sentence. Okay. <laughs> I have a bill I've worked on for two years with, drum roll please, Lindsey Graham. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I Lindsey Graham and I, Lindsey likes to say that he and I agree on almost nothing, but we do agree on this. And that is there comes a time when you've got uh, an industry like this that has such a profound effect on the nation that we really need to create a commission and a set of laws that say we're going to have curbs around this. You know, we did this with railroads in the late 1800s. We said, here they are controlling such an important part of our economy and our society, and we built the ICC. We did this actually with television and radio, right? That we need the That's FCC. Right. Yeah. We did this with nuclear power. We said, Yikes, we're going to start using nuclear. We built the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And the idea is you get more expertise, you get people who are focused on it, you get people who are nonpartisan. That's the idea. Republicans and Democrats have to come together and get people on these boards. But to put some basic curbs in place, and I think we need that everywhere. Well, here's the thing about, um, we were talking about this before in, in, in the context of uh, former President Trump, that his, uh, a lot of people think that the Trump side, the Republicans, have won the disinformation campaign. And I always get frustrated as a former newspaper person that you made a mistake in the newspaper, you got in trouble, you had to correct it, you could get sued. Um, um, the thing I think that is so scary to me is that there is no penalty yes. for um, not wrong opinions, but wrong facts right. and dangerous facts. So what do we do about that? And, and in fact, that's that's what Lindsay and I are talking about here. It's not just nobody developed any law to use in this area. It's the inverse. 
Congress years ago, when this was a fledgling little thing just starting to be born, the whole idea of doing social media, uh, put Section 230 in place that literally insulates them and, and says they can't be sued. They can engage in libelous conduct and nobody can do anything about it. Um, and so that's why it is so important now to say you can't have it both ways. You can't have insulation from being sued by private citizens who get injured and, and listen to some of those stories that come before Congress. People who come in to testify about their, their children who were harassed online, children who killed themselves. Um, terrible events that the parents believe um, really had engagement from the social media site itself. It, and the point is, you can't have it both ways, social media. You can't say, I want to be totally insulated from private lawsuits, and I don't want to have any kind of federal regulation. Nobody gets that in America. No industry gets the, you can't regulate me anywhere in any way. So you do you think that there is a bipartisan support for doing something serious about so that's what Lindsay and I want to do. That's, that's what our bill is. It's basically saying, if you all want to hang on to Section 230, that means individuals and organizations can't bring lawsuits against you, then you have to submit to some basic rules of the road. We have to be able to put some curbs in place about your behavior. We're talking to Senator Elizabeth Warren. Can we talk uh, to Elizabeth Warren as a human, not a senator, for a second? <laughs> no, I, I, I like that distinction. I, 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 to be a human I think before. I've had this discussion <laughs> with you before. Uh -huh. But when you and I totally respect the fact that your job is to do good things for the people you represent. I know mm -hmm. that's the end game. You're talking about working with Lindsay, as you call him, Lindsay mm -hmm. Graham, uh, John McCain's former best friend, yeah. who is now the most ardent supporter of the odious defendant Trump who trashed John McCain every time he had an opportunity. So Lindsey Graham decides closeness to power, even if it's corrupt power, is more important than friendship. One of your other colleagues, Tommy Tuberville, the other oh. day, tweeted that Joe Biden was a garbage human being. Those are his exact words, by the way. It's not garbage human being. How do you, as a human, as a person, how do you get by those things to do what you got to do to be successful at your uh, job? You know, this is, this is really hard. Um, after January 6th, I thought, I, I just, I can't do business with these people. I can't sit down. And yet, if I don't, then fine. They get what they want. And that is nothing happens. Nothing. <clears throat> we don't move any legislation forward. We don't do anything. And so, you try to pick the places where you think it's worth it, that what you're trying to get done is important enough that it's worth reaching out there and working through the provisions. You know, I said when I was talking about this thing with Lindsey Graham, we've worked on this for over two years. Mm -hmm. And when I say worked on it, I mean really worked on it. We met, our staffs met, I went over over and over, different provisions. There are other parts to this that I'd love to talk about, like the antitrust provisions in it. It would strengthen our antitrust laws in this area around social media. I'm ready to talk about interoperability. Please, please, please. I love all this. Um, and the time spent talking with Lindsay to try to both understand where he comes from on it and to try to get him to have a little wider vision of what we might do and ultimately decided better to advance this with Lindsey Graham than either not advance it at all or advance it as a democratic only bill in which case we're going to have a really hard time ever getting it passed. It's the voice of Senator Elizabeth Warren. You know this is a selfish question because I spend a lot of time driving back and forth to Cape Cod every summer and I'm, when I got stuck in traffic on the Sagamore Bridge, I have nightmares about you know the whole thing collapsing, going right there down into the Cape Cod. What, canal. you don't like driving on a bridge that had a 50-year lifespan when it was built no. and it's now 90 years old? That's right. And you go over, they got a big sign right there above you, not, built in 1933. I think it was when it was finished in 1933. And expected to end yeah. its useful life yeah. in 19... What would that be? So uh, I, yeah. I know that uh, uh, you and, and, and Senator Markey and Bill Keating from the Cape, the congressman, have got this money, three hundred fifty million dollars. Uh, when do we think going to? I mean, what's yes. the what's the roadmap here? Okay, so here's the roadmap. 
uh, the first thing is you got to have money to do this. And I want to give a big shout out to what it's like to work with the Healy administration. Uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor have been terrific. And we have done a real tag team wrestling here to get as much federal money as we can back into the Commonwealth for the purposes of the bridge. That started two and a half years ago, getting President Biden to step up and just out of his budget put 25 million, this is just straight appropriation, 25 million in to start the whole planning process. So, so we're getting it ready to go. Then we got a grant, 200, uh, 372 million dollars. Yay. And then we turned around and got another appropriation that just came through with this budget that was signed into law last week, another $350 million, all coming from the federal government. There's going to have to be state government money. We still have other hooks in the water, but it really has been a joint effort to get out there and sell it to why it should be important to the president, why it should be important to other people in Congress to get direct funding for replacing these bridges. And um, I just got to say, I have made 8,932,000 phone calls <laughs> over this thing, but they paid off. You know, you Senator, think, I'm sorry. Realistically, though, we're talking at least 10 years before this new bridge. You know, bridge. I, I'm not a... I'm not Bob the Builder. Yeah. I'm, my job is to get the money in. Okay. But here's the thing. I do want you to understand this part, Marjorie. That was the importance of that first $25 million. Because a lot of times nobody starts even saying, oh, it'll be a bridge. It'll go from here to here. Until they've locked down all the funding. The $25 million was to stay. Lay out those plans now. Get your blueprints. Figure out if you're going to have a bike lane. How wide is the thing going to be? How are you going to phase it in? Because we've got two bridges we have right. to replace. And that started two years ago. So that at least gives us a leg up on the process. Okay. So I thought you were going to say the sign said abandoned hope. Well, we <laughs> do enter here, but that wasn't. So, uh, you had, were you following up with that? Or are you. No, I, I just. Turn I, I was hoping that I, I wouldn't be dead before the new bridge is here. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. Or because of the old bridge. <laughs> Senator Warren, you mentioned Governor Healy and uh, the president. Uh, the only. We have Governor Healy on every month, and while she carefully. Uh, she's not critical of the president. She has been very critical of the, uh, the uh, migrant situation yeah. that uh, individual states have been put in, including uh, Massachusetts. We have a right to shelter law, even though the courts have now said we don't have to abide. I think it's fair to say by the right to shelter law, I guess, because of the emergency uh, situation. We all know the story of uh, a very conservative Republican colleague of yours leading the charge to do this bipartisan bill that Donald Trump decided he didn't like, so all of a sudden it uh, disappeared. It, is Biden himself, I mean, it seems to me that this, as a, as somebody miles away from where you work, that this and the situation with Gaza, the border in Gaza, are, are, have put Joe Biden's re-election at great risk. Are you of the opinion that there's more that he can do by executive action while the Congress continues to do nothing about this? Well, this is tough, as you know. This is the reason that we started these negotiations last October. Mm -hmm to be able to get more resources down to the border. That was the, that was the principal thing. And when the Republicans killed the deal, um, they said no more funding. And, and so the problem we've got here is that people show up, but we don't have the administrative law judges to be able to evaluate the claims quickly. Uh, we don't have federal money to be able to send to the shelters, whether they're in Massachusetts or New York, or they're right down at the border in Brownsville. So starving the funding means that the degrees of freedom that the president has got are really, really, really limited. The one I have pushed on right to the edge is work permits, because if people who are here could get a work permit and support themselves, that would at least relieve the burden on the state. Can we stop there for a sure. second? We, last time Governor Hilly was on, we broached that very topic. Mm -hmm. Because my understanding, and I think Marjorie's too, is that while Governor Hilly has done everything she can within the system that she's given by the feds to expedite the granny of work permits, and she has, from what I understand, mm -hmm. my understanding was that the president has not granted the broadest spectrum of 
the broadest latitude to states to issue these work permits. And when we ask, you're making a face, so I'm probably wrong, that doesn't require congressional approval, that the, the uh, president could make it much easier. Am I wrong? So I, I'm going to describe it this way. Where we were two years ago, uh, in terms of how long it took mm -hmm. to get work permits approved, much, much longer. It was literally being measured in years. And people who had been here a long time still couldn't get work permits. Um, what's happened since then, I've I talked to Secretary Mayorkas, there was a period of time almost every day about trying to get him to speed up. And looking, you know, this is kind of the down into the gritty part of government, looking into the, well, can you apply online? Do you have to have money to apply? Can you waive the mm -hmm. fee in order to get more people to get those work permits as quickly as possible? And Mayorkas, which is the Biden administration, has much shortened the period of time on work permits. But do understand, there's an underlying federal law that says that when someone comes here uh, to uh, ask for asylum, literally because of laws that Congress wrote in years back, they cannot even apply for a work permit for at least five months. And the president, there's nothing he can do about that. So there's nothing that I was wrong then. There's nothing he can do that he hasn't done in terms of expediting work permits for those who are eligible for I, it, or I, could be eligible for them. We have shrunk down that time where it's bumping into the legal constraints. And do understand, People are here under different programs. Different programs have mm. different requirements on this. But it really is the case of having moved it just about as tight as you can until Congress opens up. And gum it, that was part of this bill that the Republicans first negotiated and then tanked. It had a much smoother path to get people those work permits and get them fast. Have you spoken to the Oklahoma senator since the bill was killed? I do not talk about so, private conversations. So you have. And he spoke back to the president the other did, night the during state the state of the union. Union. Yeah, he was saying that's that right. said right. You know, Senator, so we began this discussion asking you about Israel and, and Gaza. And as mm -hmm. I said, many Texas wanted to know, you want to get a ceasefire over there. You want the humanitarian aid in, but you voted for the $14 billion that we had to do with Ukraine. Um, that that was part of the deal, getting funding for Ukraine. Um, we've watched you know, the horrors of Ukraine yeah. as well. And we had, the, we're very proud here at GBH, uh, 20 Days in Mariupol just won the Academy Award for Best Documentary mm -hmm. Film about the horrors of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, the Speaker of the House, Johnson, is not going to bring that up to a vote. So what do you think is going to happen uh, with Ukraine? Do you think that that's ever, he will ever bring it up to a vote? Or is there any sense of urgency or sh embarrassment or shame? I, you know, I... I have no reason to believe that the Speaker of the House understands urgency, embarrassment, or shame. Um, he dances to Donald Trump's tune. And I am enormously worried about what's happening in Ukraine. I, I, the president, I don't know if you noticed recently, it's like they went through the administration and they found uh, some more millions of dollars, right. nothing close to what Ukraine needs. But 300 trying to, million or something? Yeah, trying to scrape. It was almost yeah. like, you know, when you've, you've done a cake batter and you're, you're trying to get it out of the pan, you're trying to get that last little bit out of the bowl to try to get as much as we can to Ukraine. The Europeans have stepped up. Other allies around the world have stepped up. But the United States needs to needs to be the one doing this. And by the way, I should mention, you know, most of this money is actually spent at home. Did, did you know that about it? I don't know what you mean. Because that's where but, the weaponry is made, right? Because we make oh, oh, the oh, weapons. Oh, okay. And so this is actually about, much of this is domestic spending. It's domestic spending for weapons of war. But what it is that Ukraine needs. Um, the one option that I, I'm sure you all have talked about is 218 votes to get a discharge yeah. petition. It takes time, but it also takes courage on the part of Republicans who are willing to say, I'm not following the Donald Trump law. Well, just two or a handful of Republicans. Just a handful. Are very small. Just a handful. You know, you said earlier, I know you only have a few minutes left. We really appreciate your time. You said earlier you were sort of dismissive of polling, but I'm going to return to that just for a minute uh, and then just one last thing after. Is uh, I actually think polling, unfortunately, in this case is fairly accurate. And while we spend so much time talking about the the behavior and of the demented, dehumanizing Donald Trump, 
The reality is tens of millions of people, even if the polls are off a little bit, seem to be fine with this. They're fine with not supporting a quest for to protect democracy in Ukraine, which I can't imagine in my lifetime. They're fine with the guys who who's in love with the murderous Putin uh, and the things that he said just that the other night. You know, in Ohio, do you, do you worry that this disease that's infected a significant part of the electorate survives? Let's assume Trump's defeated on November 7th. Does this survive in the body of other human beings, or is it all a Trump-centered phenomenon? Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I know, and, and I don't know the answer here. I, I can tell you a little bit about how I think about it, and mm -hmm. that is there's been a lot of the, the roots of this they didn't just happen the day that Donald Trump rode down the escalator and declared that mm. he was going to be a candidate yeah. for president. This stuff has been out there. The, the racism has been out there for a long time. And frankly, Republicans playing footsie with the racists. And Republicans, you know, the, the big corporate guys who said, well, they need those people in their base in order to get elected. Because if you just said, what I'm going to do is cut taxes for the richest and most powerful and cut regulations for them, probably wouldn't be a winning strategy. So a lot of this has had a long history. On the other hand, a long history is different from giving it its head. And that's certainly what Donald Trump has done and normalizing it. Okay, one last human question before you go. Okay. Can you put your headphones on, please? <laughs> oh, put your headphones question? on. Yeah. Headphones. Now, and you may be sure. aware. Can that you hear Jim with your headphones? Can you hear me in the headphones? Can you? Yes, can you hear me? I hear you. Okay, okay. so yesterday you may be aware it was a St. Patrick's Day break. Yes. And there. He, we want to play a sound from a politician attempting to be funny yesterday. Okay. I want to have a question. Okay. Here it is. Here it is. You know, I'm wearing green, of course. I'm thinking green. Michelle Wu's Green New Deal. I'm going to get that going. I love everything green, except Marjorie Taylor Green. Now, that was, that was <laughs> moderately funny from some politician. M moderately, the bracket, funny. Okay, moderately funny. Okay. On so a scale of one to ten, I'm like a <laughs> yep. six. Can you raise your right hand when yeah. you answer this? Would you prefer to go to the St. Patrick's Day breakfast or be waterboarded? Which are, th Ooh, those were your two choices. Tough, what, would, what would you choose? No, tell no. the truth. I, I would go to St. Patrick's you Day You would? And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Okay, my part, it is. It's kind of embarrassing and I'm not very good at it. You were as funny I do my as best. anybody. All right. But I like watching everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, listen, some of the jokes are funny and sometimes maybe it's good to make politicians squirm. Yeah. Like the governor, okay. the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the dunk yeah. queens. Dunk queens, yeah. Know, with the, the dunk hats queens, on they the were arm. there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I got a kick out of that. She, she was raising the right hand, so I assume uh -huh. she yeah. believes there it. There we go. Governor, uh, Senator Warren, we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being so generous with it today. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks thank for you having very, very much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Good to Senator be here. Elizabeth we have Warren. Been speaking By the way, who's running for re-election, we should say, and I'm yeah. sure we'll talk to you plenty before uh, November. It's on the, it's but... Directfile.irs.gov. Go check and see if you can do your taxes Please do. for free, online, no upselling, no stealing your data. A lot of good things That's come great. from this. That's really you think great. regular people can figure this out? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think right. so too. Yeah. Okay. It's great. Well, maybe I should try it then. Good to see you. I <laughs>